Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and a CLL patient myself. I'm the co-founder, executive vice president, and chief medical officer of the nonprofit CLL Society. Dr. Patton, can you introduce yourself? Thanks very much. Um, I'm Dr. Patton. I work in London. I work for King's College London. I'm a clinical senior lecturer there. And I also have a large CLL clinical practice at two related hospitals, uh, guys in St. Thomas's Hospital and King's College Hospital, both of them are situated in South East London in the UK. Dr. Patton, you are a physician scientist who's done a lot of research on the underlying immune issues that are involved in CLL. And you've also published some very practical and somewhat disturbing research on how the recent COVID pandemic has affected the CLL community. I'm wondering if you could give us just some perspective in a patient-friendly way about what's going on in the immune system with CLL, why the pandemic was so bad for CLL, and maybe give us a little perspective on things are better now, what, what's changed, what's different. Um, so if you could kind of lay that out for us a little bit, because um, we all know that we're at high risk, but maybe you could explain why that is. I know immunity is complicated, but anything you can help us with would be appreciated. <laughs> all right, thanks very much. Um, well, I think the pandemic illustrated to us in an unfortunately quite stark manner that patients with CLL do or can have an impaired immune system. Um, the reasons for this are, are actually quite complex and it's not entirely due to the, um, the CLL cell itself. It's the effect that the CLL cell has on other cells and it can affect both other normal B lymphocytes, and of course, a CLL cell is a B lymphocyte, but it can affect other immune cells. You may have heard of T cells and, and also other components of the immune system. And we don't really understand in any individual patient why one or any of these cells may be affected, but all the cells come together as a, as a sort of orchestration of the immune response to fight any infection. And I guess if you have one lever, which isn't firing quite as well as it might do, that can affect the general immunity. The best way really for a CLL patient, I think, to tell if they're likely to have immune problems is, are they, are they tending to get infections on a day-to-day -day basis or before they were diagnosed or, or whatever? Do they get recurrent chest infections? Do you get recurrent uh, urinary tract infections do you you know have you had episodes of shingles and things like that and that's probably the best way of gauging for yourself whether you are one of these CLL patients who may have an immune problem uh, typically patients who've got quite low level disease generally have less immune problems than patients whose disease is getting near to needing treatment and often in fact we find that patients as their disease progress just around the time we need to start introducing treatment, you're also getting in problems with, with infections. And then the other problem we can have is that infections can be made worse by the treatments we use. The drugs we're using, even though they're very targeted, are against the CLL cell themselves. So they're inevitable. They may have knock-on effects to the surrounding immune cells. So those patients who are most at risk of getting, for instance, problems with COVID are going to be those probably who've got progressive disease near the time of treatment or actually receiving treatment. And those patients who've got a low level disease or perhaps received treatment a long time ago and are now being off treatment, probably the ones who have the least problems. So I think the pandemic showed that to us quite nicely, but in fact, it's true probably for all infections that are out there. Specifically with regard to COVID, there was very little immunity in the wider population. Um, we know that were some really quite um, nasty variants out there. We know that people, um, you know, everybody, you know, was affected by it. It was particularly bad in the older populations and those patients who actually were uh, overweight and things like that. And I think CLL was just an added factor to that as well. So still the fundamental risk factor was the sort of general risk factors for COVID.
but it's important that patients with uh, uh, with CLL, uh, you know, took all the precautions that we did, and we were particularly keen on making uh, sure that's the case. I think the good news is that although CLL patients um, still do, I mean, we haven't got rid of the Im Im immune problem. I really also, like everybody else, being less affected by the COVID variants today, there's less just general less exposure because of a widespread immunity. The virus has probably changed. And also we got some great strategies which aren't necessarily just vaccinations, but uh, antivirals and also the use of antibody therapies. Talk to me a little bit about the vaccinations. You've done some research on that. We all know that we don't respond as well to vaccines, but it does seem that if we keep getting shots, we do better with more and more jabs. Is that is that an, uh, an accurate oversimplification of the response to vaccines? Well, I think that's I think that is true. I mean, I think one thing that COVID has shown with vaccines, again, in general, is that the idea of using a vaccine to reduce the intensity of infection rather than actually preventing infection is it's quite a neat, an idea which I don't think pre-COVID vaccination was you know was widely widely appreciated I'm, I'm not a vaccine doctor and certainly that wasn't the way i'd sort of seen the principles of vaccine being used i think it became fairly clear early on in the pandemic that certainly the initial responses to vaccine were certainly reduced in uh, cll patients and it seemed to be that patients with a diagnosis such as cll needed to have more vaccine doses than perhaps other people in order to get an antibody this so-called zero conversion when the antibody you could sell there was an anti-antibody effect you have to remember that's only part of the whole um, vaccine response it was also the t-cell response and we've never really measured that in quite the same way but i think it's certainly true that cell patients do benefit from more vaccines but they do get benefit from that and i certainly still a great advocate but patients have the sort of the most extreme vaccine protocols out there in terms of number because it does it does give benefit. I think some CLR patients never seem to um, get a, a, an antibody response but on the whole I think those are the uh, they're not the, the majority of patients. Most patients will with 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 a vaccine strategy. So um um, and I think it's important to carry on keeping topping up that topping up that immunity with the, the regular extra shots that people are being offered. Well, the COVID virus itself um, seems less virulent, less lethal these days. I think that's helping people, um, and we have much better uh, treatments for it. So those. In your experience, and I don't know what the literature says now, I haven't seen as much, it seems like that those horrific mortality numbers that we were seeing at the beginning of the pandemic aren't the case anymore. Is that your experience when with your patients who do get COVID? Yeah, I, I would say for the vast majority of patients I have who get COVID, um, it, 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 it it does not have serious consequences like you, you describe. I mean, we still recommend that patients get antiviral therapy. Uh, in addition, um, we still have a service in the UK that um, it, we alert patients who have a, 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 a diagnosis such as CLL will, will be assessed for whether they would benefit from uh, antiviral therapy. Um, and, and I would still recommend that. But I anecdotally know of many patients who've had uh, COVID infections where they haven't got that and then getting really no more symptoms or consequences than, than anyone else who's getting COVID today. So I think the threat of severe uh, complications from COVID does seem to have certainly significantly reduced. And, and I just know that because I'm and not seeing patients on, on the wards in the way we were in going to the intensive care unit or, or anything like that. So I, I think that's definitely true. Any final thoughts or advice you'd want to give a CLL patient in terms of the immunity, um, the fact that we are living longer now and we have such great therapies, we're having to deal with the infection risks uh, long-term. And some of the therapies are quite themselves are quite long-term or have 
even after you stop them, they still yeah. have a deleterious effect on the immune system. Yeah. So, so my advice would continue to be very aware of of infections out there, not just COVID, uh, um, other common infections we see. So I advise people to get up-to-date um, um, shots against um, pneumococcus. We now have access to the shingles vaccine, the non-live the, the non version. Uh, we're going to be vaccinating against RSV so, uh, and an annual influenza uh, in order just to make sure your immunity is as good as we, we can get it. I would take any infection that you get if it doesn't shift to to think whether you might need to get antibiotics in case there's a secondary bacterial infection, uh, for example, at an early date. But at the same time, balance that against trying to maintain, you know, a, a good quality of life. I don't think you should not not go outdoors, not go to the theatre, not go to the things that you enjoy, but just be practical and sensible about that. Avoid traveling on public transport at the absolute peak hours. You can, if you can, try and travel outside. Take sensible precautions. So I think it's a balance between uh, being as aware as possible, seeking medical attention if you've got concerns, versus also normalizing your life as much as possible would be my advice. It's finding that balance is the tricky part. It's, it's extreme. It's, it's extremely difficult, and I think one thing is to. Um, and so I, I mean, it does end up being, you know, really quite a large part of consultations today. As far as being on treatment goes, I think this is an area which we're still ourselves finding difficult to know exactly what, you know, what should happen. For example, being on a monoclonal antibody therapy, I think during while you're on that treatment and, and the immediate period afterwards, definitely your normal B cell immunity is uh, impaired. Quite what being on a long-term BTK inhibitor therapy does is, is difficult to say. And, with, and there are protocols out there looking at whether there might be a role for interrupting therapy or not. All I would say is the data I've seen so far, we actually don't know. And I would still strongly advise, unless you're on a trial protocol where your doctors are monitoring that, to, to, to not take things into your own hands and, and definitely consult your own doctor about what you want to do. At those times. Well, Dr. Patton, I'm so grateful that you're thinking about these things, researching these things, and we'll, we'll stay in contact because this is an increasingly important image uh, it, uh, issue for um, patients now since the pandemic. It's really thrust to our front. And it's not just COVID, it's all other infections that we worry about. I couldn't agree more. It is not just COVID, it's all infections. <laughs> Thanks so much. Great. Thank you.